Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to your Rattlecast. Uh, thanks so much for joining me. Our, we're, our stream is not running on Facebook. It will not let me, uh, let me start it, which is very frustrating. But uh, hopefully everybody who usually watches on Facebook will come over to YouTube, and we'll see how that goes. Sorry for the bit of a delay in start. But uh, as always, Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry, We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love poetry, and I know you do too, so please do click the like button, share, make sure you're subscribed. Whatever you can do to help spread poetry around the internet would be much appreciated. Now, as always, we have um, Poets Respond to start out with. And today's uh, Poets Respond poem from Sunday is right here. I'm going to put it up on screen. This is a wonderful hyben by Kate McQueen. Let me put it up on screen for everybody right now. Here we go. So this is Morning Star. I'll read you what she says about it. Yeah. So Kate says this. Uh, things have a way of heating up in August in the Northern Hemisphere. This week, it was the Washington Post noting that the largest nuclear power plant in Europe um, Zaporizhia, I can't say that, lies in southern, or southeastern Ukraine. It has been held by Russian forces since March, but amplified fighting over recent weeks has led to an unprecedented fear of nuclear catastrophe, coinciding with a brutal war. That's a quote from the uh, newspaper. I guess a fear of a nuclear catastrophe coinciding with a brutal war could be described as unprecedented, since few people knew they needed to fear such a thing until 8.15 a.m., on August 6, 1945, when a bombardier in the North Carolina, uh, from North Carolina dropped the first atomic bomb, nicknamed Little Boy, from a plane named for the pilot's grandmother, Enola Gay, on Hiroshima. History doesn't repeat itself exactly, but it does provide inspiration in ways that really should be anticipated. And that is uh, the comment from Kate McQueen. And here is her just wonderful hive, and there's so much richness in this. Give it a listen, and uh, let's hear it. Morning Star. Many people call these the dog days. In North Carolina, we have our own names for the seasons, and we call this one Hell's Front Porch. Hot and humid August can make a dog inclined to hide under the porch, but that's not why these are called dog days. The real story is that this is the time of year when Sirius, the dog star, first rises with the sun and is then the brightest star in the morning sky. Imagine the dogs with their backs up on an August morning, a little boy held in his grandmother's embrace, the heat quickly rising, and Lucifer watching from the front porch. That patch of dirt where everything dies, Hiroshima Day. Just a beautiful hymen by uh, Kate McQueen. Um, if you don't know what the hymen form is, it's this um, prose uh, prose uh, paragraph followed by a haiku that kind of undercuts and changes it. And there's just so much richness um, to this. There's so much um, you know, references to Little Boy and the Grandmother. And then uh, that beautiful haiku at the end. Just a wonderful poem uh, by Kate McQueen. So thanks so much for, uh, to her for sharing that with us on Sunday. Now we're going to take a quick break, and I will see if I can get Facebook fired up. And we will uh, get to our main guest, Rachel Malalu. So hang on, and I will be right back in just a moment.
And we're back on uh, Facebook, too. Thanks so much for your patience. Sorry uh, we had to cut off the first chunk on Facebook there. Uh, there was a little problem with the stream setup, but I was able to fix it during the break. So we're also rolling on Facebook now. Um, but as I mentioned, today's guest is Rachel Malalu. She's been, um, and I think, in one issue of Rattle and twice in Poets Respond. She's an emergency room physician and mother of five. She writes poetry in her spare time. And Rachel's the author of A History of Resurrection from Alien Buddha Press, which is right here. Uh, some of her recent work has published her forthcoming in Blood and Thunder, Nell Tribes, Dialogist, Willow Wept Review, and a whole bunch of others. Rachel lives with her husband and children in Maryland and practices emergency room medicine just outside of Baltimore. And here she is, Rachel Malalu. Hey, Rachel, thanks so much for joining me today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, um, I think maybe we should start with a poem from the book, but I was sitting on my couch back there, just like crying <laughs> like the whole the whole afternoon reading this book. It's such a touching book, and everybody will see why in just a little bit, but do you want to do you want to start out with a first poem? Sure. So the first poem, which is actually the poem that opens the book, is called My Life. I found my old journals in the closet under the stairs and sat on the basement floor to read, falling in love with the girl who wrote them. She hiked at night and envisioned ribbons of moonlight tangled in dark streams. She wept when she read Elie Wiesel. Her hands went cold when she heard the Alleluia Dies Santificatus. I could almost remember the taste of her tears and feel her pulse when I touched my wrist. But I need to tell you what happened last night. A woman came in bleeding, and when I examined her, a baby gushed out, a baby slipped out in a gush of blood. I caught him. His body only filled my palm, and his legs dangled toward my elbow. He waved his hand and took on even gulps of air. She, so racked with grief and anger, would not hold him, so I did until his heart no longer beat beneath his translucent skin. She wept then, a mother twice, but also never. And soon after, an ambulance brought me a young man whose face was swollen from the peanuts which stopped his heart and closed his lungs. I tried, tried for an over an hour, but I could not keep him here. And then his mother arrived and I informed her that her son was dead. She told me I was wrong. Her hands trembled as she found a picture to prove to me that it was not her boy, but I was not mistaken. And when she finally went to see him, she wailed, that's my baby, and lowered the bed rail to climb into the gurney and better hold him. Maybe now you'll understand what I mean when I say sometimes I feel cord, my insides filled with sawdust, and why when I got home that morning, I crawled into bed with my youngest son and because I was so cold, I wrapped my arms around his oven of a body. But even then, I did not cry. Yeah, and that was the first poem of the book, My Life, uh, from A History of Resurrection, uh, Rachel Malalu's newest collection. Um, so, Rachel, I, it's just fascinating um, to have a poet who does other things besides poetry in general, but an emergency room physician um, is, is quite a leap from poetry. There aren't that many um, doctor poets. I mean, William, William Carlos Williams, but, but emergency room work is so intense too. Um, how is it that you came to do both at the same time? Well, it's actually, uh, before I went to medical school, I was an English major. Mm -hmm. So that's probably my first and greatest love. I, I studied that for four years, didn't do much writing other than you know a million papers. I think I only had one creative writing class in my degree. Then I went to medical school. My dad, who's also a doctor, told me, write everything down, write everything down. But I didn't because medical school is really, really busy. Yeah, and then I went to residency, which is even more overwhelming. And then I had kids. Mm -hmm. And so for so long, I've seen things that no one in this world had ever seen. And they were fresh to me. Um, and I just didn't have time. I didn't have time. Maybe I'd scribble something down. But and then quite honestly, um, in 2014, my youngest son had a near fatal drowning event and I'm the one who did his CPR and resuscitated him. He was in full cardiac arrest and that was such a traumatic thing. And I had so many intrusive images that I had to deal with and I was so numb afterward and never took me uh, weeks to cry that finally by writing it again and again and again, um, that's actually how I started to write again because of that event. And once I started, I realized I, I was kind of dealing probably with a lot of, I don't want to say trauma, I hate throwing that word around, but a lot of things through years of emergency room medicine and things that I saw that no one else did and found that it was actually just pretty easy to write about and just started writing. Yeah, well, these are such powerful poems and, and so, you know, um, straightforwardly told too, like it's so clear 
that you have something to write about and like something to get out with each, with each of these poems, which is what makes them just so, so strong and stand out on the page so much. Uh, let's hear the next one. The next one is called A Conspiracy of Loss. The summer I was pregnant with my first son, I tried to trade his life for my father's. Perhaps his DNA imprinted the moment I pointed the bike downhill, accelerated and pitched over the handlebars. When on my abdomen ached that night, I promised God he could take my baby if he left my dad. Consequently, my son was born with my father's generous forehead, but lacks his gentle ways. I'm lonely and bored, so I'm always on my phone. I scroll Twitter for cruelty and politics and study Instagram's filtered truths. Facebook tries to peddle me curated memories. Here are the boys with seed pearls of baby teeth. I didn't post the day Simon drowned in our pool. There aren't pictures of his dusky body as I pumped his chest with the heel of one hand. No status describes my mouth over his lips while I prayed the waterlogged bellows of his lungs would fill. At least the box of old pictures is honest. In grainy photos, my grandmother dies in increments. Here, the clumsy left hand. There, the vacant doll eyes. At one time, my cousin and I looked alike, though I was jealous of her curls. In this one, we wear bikinis and vie for his attention. When she died last summer, even the undertaker couldn't repair the jaundiced ruin of her skin. My children have removed my skin and softened my bones. My insides are unprotected. When I hug my oldest son, his arms dangle at his sides. My head reaches his chest and I hear a thump as familiar as my own. I hope he hears my whisper. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And that was Conspiracy of Loss. Again, we're reading poems from Rachel Malalu's book, A History of Resurrection. Um, and it, it's it's so interesting that you talk about poetry coming to you because, you know, as a response to that traumatic experience, because that's so much of what poets, you know, do. Like so many people come to poetry through that kind of thing that they're trying to process. And poetry becomes a way to process and heal and make sense of the things that have happened to us. Um, do you feel like... Um, you know, after you've got through that that experience, that it, it shifted to all your experiences in the emergency room at that point, and then and, and do you feel like you're ever gonna like run out of the need to write like that? Like, it's, you know, it it fe- feels very much like you're getting this stuff out. Um, do Do you ever like think that there's like an end to it? I wonder. So I, I have had that worry, and then uh, we had this thing called a pandemic, <laughs> and had, like, it just gave me so much new material, you know, and 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 anger and frustration and sadness and you know again experiences that i never had um which after 20 years of emergency medicine doesn't come very often to have new experiences something you've never seen and then you know seeing things that no matter how much anybody thinks they know nobody's ever seen you know that doesn't work in a hospital so i i and then just recently actually, you know, so I wrote a lot about the pandemic. Some of them are in the book, not all of them are. And then just the other day, I I think the last time I worked or the second last time I worked, I had a, another trauma and it was a young man who was, who was shot and he died. And as I processed that, it had been a minute since that had happened. I was, oh, okay. There's actually still new things and new feelings and I still have feelings. And so I think as long as I work emergency medicine, sadly, I'm probably never going to run out of material because there's always something that's mm-hmm. happening. Yeah, reading the book, it feels like it's like every night. Is it like like <laughs> traumatic every night or are there like quiet nights? <laughs> if it were that traumatic every night, we would all actually like, I mean, unless you're a shock trauma doctor mm-hmm. and you, you know, like we have University of Maryland shock trauma in the city and those doctors, like it legitimately might be that way for them most nights. Mm-hmm. Um, but as an emergency physician, not a trauma surgeon, it's not that way every night. But every night, I mean, there's no quiet nights anymore. Those those days are gone too, mm-hmm. because we're so understaffed that even if you don't have the volume or the insanity, it always feels like you're, you know, just about ready to die and, you know, not enough to eat or drink or, you know, patient to patient to patient. Mm-hmm. And even if people aren't dying, even if people aren't getting shy, even if people aren't ending up on ventilators, there's a million quiet, tiny tragedies too. Mm-hmm. You know, there's the, the patient with dementia who can't remember their daughter. There's... Um, telling somebody they have cancer. I mean, that's not a tiny tragedy, but you know, it's not as dramatic as uh, a gunshot. So there are just so, if I probably paid attention, which I, I don't every night, my, one of my goals has always been to pay attention and take a story from each night. Mm-hmm. 
which I don't do. But if I were to, I would probably have some sort of story every night of something that, you know, was an actual event in someone's life Mm -hmm. that changed them. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you can't help but think as you see an ambulance go by down the street, like that's someone's worst day, you know, and and then pulling into the hospital every night over and over again. Yes. I mean, I just can't imagine. I don't know if anybody can imagine what it's like to work there. And so it's one of the reasons why we have to have poems about real, you know, life outside of poetry. And so to have your experiences put into words this way, it's just a, a wonderful, powerful thing. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, the shortages that have been t- we've been having so much is that is that because of burnout? Like, what is the main issue behind that? I think I do think a lot of it's burnout and the nurses. Um, you know, I mean, the physician obviously we get worked over, but and I have to see every patient. Maybe I have fifteen patients, but I don't do every thing for that patient. I see them, I assess them. I do a procedure, I order things, but the nurses are the ones who are giving the medicine, starting the IVs, pulling the blood, wiping up, you know, the fluids, whatever. And because of that, I think they are even privy to a lot more abuse than we are. And I think I I heard a a term that's been coined called moral injury. And that's just these things that are just happening that shouldn't be happening to people, the things people say to us, the things we see, the deaths over and over again. And I think that is taking its toll. And so a lot of nurses have quit. Mm -hmm. A lot of nurses have left emergency medicine. A lot of nurses have sought other careers. Um, And now I'm actually, even in my group, there's doctors that are leaving. Um, There's doctors that are taking early retirement. There's doctors that are going really, really part-time. because these last few years have just been horrible. Mm -hmm. So, and the same thing, and it's across the board, it's with techs, it's with, you know, I mean, when we come to the hospital now and we're having to have active shooter drills because, you know, a couple months ago, somebody, there was a, there was a shooting outside my hospital and somebody died legitimately in the parking lot of the hospital. And then there was a patient that had to be disarmed with a, with a loaded gun in the hospital. So it's like all that insanity, like how, why, when does it become worth it anymore? Mm -hmm. So I think that's what a lot of people are um, responding to. Yeah. It's a, it's sort of a dark thought, but I was thinking about how, when I worked as a a counselor at a group home for uh, mentally ill adults, the burnout was so intense there that the average person worked like um 18 months i think was how long people lasted before they quit um Mm. and i think the reason that that doctors don't might just be because there's so much investment in how much training and how much schooling you've been through so like there's so much resistance to give up but man i mean everybody must be at the end of their ropes especially i mean even before covid but with the But with COVID, too, on top of it, I don't know. I mean, we all, um, you know, like Jimmy Pappas here says, um, thank you, Rachel, for your service in the emergency room. We all appreciate what you do. Incredibly poignant. Oh, this is Jamie T. Incredibly poignant, but curiously enough, welcomely poignant. Um, Hard to articulate, but powerful for sure. Um, Yeah, I mean, we just appreciate what you do so much, but it's just just hard to imagine, you know, having to go through that. And and your poem was about COVID, too, and how difficult that was. I think two of the poems we published were about the COVID era of yours. And um, I don't know. I mean, our heart just goes out to you. It just seems like such a rough thing. Although, um, I I guess I don't want to dwell on that. Let's let's, uh, read another poem. (laughs) I'm ill suited for anything else. Unfortunately, you know, okay, I don't have a ton of other career options, although I have a couple side gigs. So don't worry. I pulled back even myself from some of my clinical shifts. Oh, really? So yeah, I, I do. They're still medicine related, but I do some admin work and different things. I get me a break. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm making it. Don't okay. worry. <laughs> this next one's called um, a history of resurrection. Everyone marveled when Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead. But on a hot night in August, I resurrected the same junkie twice in one shift. When someone pushed her out of the car a second time, she still wore the gauze and tape in the crook of her left elbow where we'd so recently placed the IV. This time, the Narcan worked so slow. So, ugh, I'm so sorry. This time, the Narcan worked so slowly that I had a blade in her mouth, ready to place the breathing tube. Then her eyes flew open and she pushed my hand away. Thanks for nothing, bitch. Next time, let me die. Before Lazarus was resurrected, his sisters wailed and mourned, overcome by the brutal humanity of it all, afflictions, heartache, the certitude of death, Jesus wept. After he wept, Jesus prayed, for he knew that raising Lazarus would lead many to faith. And each time that I am brought another addict who is still in blue, I offer silent prayers while searching for a vein, 
though it is hard for me to keep the faith. I ready the antidote, but even Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead only once. And that was the title poem, History of Resurrection. Um, and that is just that that is one of the first I mean, the, the, that line about um, saving someone a second time in the same night. I mean, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, she really did yell at me. She yeah. <laughs> she was probably actually much more foul than I put in that in that uh, poem. Yeah, she uh -huh. was she was mad because we cut her clothes off because when we brought her in that they didn't know she was just unconscious and we have to expose her we cut her clothes off and she just let me have it that we cut her bra that mm -hmm. was i mean i was like but you're alive she's like just let me die i'm like uh -huh. i can't <laughs> so have you noticed like the like a tangible change as the opioid epidemic has like accelerated like are those kind of things increasing in a way that you can just feel without even looking at numbers Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I would have to um, kind of tie that to the pandemic. And then, mm -hmm. of course, fentanyl, which yeah. is mixed in everything, even weed now. Mm -hmm. um, oh, wow. Really? Yeah. We've had we've had people that think they just did one drug who end up testing positive for a whole bunch of drugs that they didn't intend on doing. Oh, wow. um, so I would I would say that our overdoses are used um, are even our like so our accidental overdoses and our intentional overdoses on opioids um, have been, have, I feel like they've increased and I don't even, I haven't even looked at the numbers, mm -hmm. but especially during quarantine, it felt like that got really bad and alcoholism, the whole thing, not just opioids, Yeah, um, mm -hmm. all substances. Um, so, so given all this, you know, stuff that you're going through in your day job, how, where do you find time to write? Like, what's your process like? Do you find places between shifts or do you like wait till you have a vacation like how does that how do the poems come i'm so horrible about doing it on vacation i wish i could i should um so now my kids are all school age so that was you know it used to be nap time now if they're at school and i'm not working and i don't work as much as i used to so i have days off and i'm doing a lot because i have a lot of kids but um I've also had had kind of a mentor, someone I signed up for, and he would send prompts. And then uh, his name is Matthew Littman. He's a poet as well. Uh, he would send prompts and then do um, edits. And so when someone's forcing me to write, okay, you have to write a poem a week. I'm super good at it. So I've done a bunch of those, which I've gotten um, a lot of material out of. I've done a few generative workshops. And then sometimes um, something happens that's just so big that you know, like for instance, with the Uvalde shooting that I have no choice. It just, I have to write. Mm -hmm. And, and like I write often, immediately like after at the moment, or actually what I'll usually do is I'll, I walk, um, I hike in the woods with my dog almost every day. If it's nice. And if I'm by myself, I'll write it in my head and I'll have most of it written in my head. And then it's just a matter of once it's formed in my head, putting out my computer, doing word edits, you know, doing some line breaks and I can actually get them done pretty quickly that way. So it's, you know, and I'll, I'll do months where I have six poems in a month. And then like this summer, I think I've only written three. It's been a bad dry summer. And I just keep on telling myself that I'm going to um, edit the work I have. Yeah. So. Um, well, I do. I can attest to that. That's why we do the once a week prompt here. Because if, it, if I don't have a reason, I just, you know, put it off and then don't. So I need some kind of like, oh, there's a deadline. And then. An hour before the show starts, I write a poem really quick. But at least it gets me going, you know. It's it's good. You got to have something like that, in my experience. Um, if anybody has any questions for uh, Rachel, I'm just reminded you can leave them in the chat windows on YouTube or Facebook. I'm monitoring both, and both are actually working now. Um, so um, let's see. So let's read another poem first, I guess. And then we'll talk. Okay. I want to talk a little about the way you craft poems, but let's read another poem first. All right. Um, this poem is Eyes Open, and this does have to do with miscarriage and dead babies, so I feel like if anybody's really sensitive to that, just that's my warning. My neighbor believes when a person dies with their eyes open, it's because they are waiting for someone. In a small hospital outside Philadelphia, I helped deliver a baby, already blue. Her eyes stayed closed. She did not wait for her mother whose pupils were so dilated from the ecstasy and cocaine that she wouldn't see her child. No one wanted to hold her, so they placed her body in a basin that was too small. She lay curled on her side, each dusky fist clutching air. 
A dead baby nestles beneath your sternum and snags your lungs when you take a deep breath, but I don't get to choose what I see. This is how I know life isn't fair. A pregnant mother checked in. She was bleeding and wept with expectation as I put her legs in stirrups. When I placed the speculum, her 13 week baby spilled into my hand with an iron gush of blood. His eyelids were tightly fused and rivers traversed his diaphanous skin. As she felt his body exit hers, she wailed mama into the corners of the stifling room. My baby's eyes were open when my husband fished him from our swimming pool on that warm day in June. His mottled skin matched the sky, but he was waiting for me. I pushed his chest with one hand and kissed the ice of his lips. And then he pulled a jagged breath. His eyelashes trembled. Mama is the word I tell myself, he said. Let well, his eyes open. Again, another poem from uh, the History of Resurrection. Um, one of the things that stands out in your work is that there's like a consistency to the voice as your as your storytelling goes. Like you have this a style of, of there's a certain pacing that's similar between the poems, and there's a certain there's a lack of punctuation. Like stanzas kind of serve as punctuation as you move through the pacing of the poem. Um, how did you how did you come to that style? Is that is that the way you've always written? Did it take a long time to find that? Um, how did how did your writing style come to be? And that's actually funny because I've actually. I feel like recently changed some of that. Um, I have no actual training in writing other than these, you know, studying English, being an avid reader, and then some of the work I've done with Matthew. Um, so I, I don't really know. <laughs> like, they just, I just write the story and then I would kind of make the breaks where I thought that, you know, an, an idea or something ended. Um, and it's funny because I think I emailed you a little about this. I actually did a, a workshop with Edward Hirsch this summer and we talked a lot about lineation and line breaks and ending on a certain word. And he's he's like, How, where do you want it to be? Do you want to be a very good poet? Do you want to be a next level poet? And so his what he told me is that to you know to level up, this these are the things that I really had to start concentrating on. Mm -hmm. And stanzas, he's really into stanzas. I don't know how I feel about everything being stanza. But so recently I have, I feel like it's some of my work that's either forthcoming or hasn't been published yet, been trying to do more in kind of um, regular stanzas with some more punctuation, just to see if that kind of, makes the the story a little more clear mm -hmm. or the image is a little more clear so I've, i'm like a homeschooled poet <laughs> so well, anything that, i mean that's the thing, like organic. i think yeah. i told you I, I remember i forgot about that conversation we had over email but um but i think i told you that uh and i love the natural way that your voice it's like a sort of a natural storytelling that just doesn't get in the way like the poetics don't get in the way of what you're right. telling and there's just such an authenticity to it which is just what um, I don't know. I mean, just just really got to me reading these poems and, and everybody here, too. I mean, people are are leaving great comments. Um, there's there's a question here uh, from Judith Fay. She asks, um, would you share with us about uh, that turn you made from English major to med school and where your father fits into that choice? Oh, that's so smart, because, of course, the first thing is, of course, my father's a doctor. I'm a first child. Um, I was serviceably bright. And, you know, everyone's like, oh, you should be a doctor. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know if that's what I wanted to do, but I did know going into college that I love, love, love literature. So my dad was like, always come out of college, being able to have at least two jobs. So all I did was take my um, prerequisites for medical school during my English major. So I'm not double majored. I didn't do any extra time. There's actually, there's like, I don't know, six you're like six courses you have to have to get into medical school. Mm -hmm. And then I took my MCATs. So I ended up going straight to medical school and kind of always knew I was heading that way, but I guess I had the option that I could have pursued the English degree further or been a teacher or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't, I never really wanted to be a teacher. Um, maybe, I don't know if I would now either. I don't know. I've had, I've had thoughts since like, maybe I should have just been a professor, mm -hmm. but uh, I really, I do love emergency medicine and it probably was the right choice for me. And I did love it very much. It's just been a, a hard few years. Um, but yeah, that's how you know, first child dad, a doctor, it's, it's really hard not to become one in my experience. Although I think my eldest is in no danger. So we'll have, we'll have done something right. Yeah, and I'm I mean, married to a doctor too. So uh, if my, if my eldest could not do either, then he's like, 
he he broke it <laughs> <laughs> that might be good or bad yeah um, so so does, does the good i mean you do so much good in that job i mean it must be exhilarating that aspect of it but we all have negativity bias where the the negative stands out so much more than the positive even if it's like uh, 99 to 1 the ratio um do you find um the the uplifting parts redeem the the hard parts I do. And, and honestly, even some of those hard parts and some of these, and these are all real stories. I wish I made up one of them, but I, there's not one made up story in this book. They've all happened in one way or another. Even some of those hard, horrible times and places, like when I tell that, that mom trying to, her hand shaking, because she showed me pictures, she's like, it's not him, it's not him, it's not him. And I knew it was. I do find the redeeming in that I can be gentle and I can be empathetic and I can be kind. And I know that I can, this sounds ridiculous, but I can tell somebody that their family member died in about as, as good as somebody could tell you that your family member died. So I I have always made it my goal to, to never become cynical because that's the huge, you could become cynical and you can turn into a horrible person, but that's a choice. And to just be as kind as I can and to have like keep everybody's humanity at the forefront. So even if I'm doing a horrible thing like a death notification or taking care of a mom who's, you know, baby died or had a miscarriage. Um, but then, of course, there are also exhilarating saves. And I have those, you know, in a file in my brain as well. They're just, you know, they just don't bring as much pathos. It's harder to write about something amazing and happy. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, that was actually a, a question from Joe Barca. He asked, um, do you write any poetry that is not first person and maybe lighter? Do you, do you, do you work <laughs> at that? Um, so I've read, so not first person. Um, I'm trying to think if I have a non first person. So I don't have a I, light poetry is definitely not my, my sweet spot. And I don't think I've ever been accused of having a light poem. I do. I am working. Actually, I have a mini chat book. If I ever finish it, it's on my list of things to do. It's called a manual for motherhood and they're little prose poems and they're ridiculous and they're actually pretty funny. Um, and all like ABCD, you know, and like that. So that's something I'm working on and that's not in first person and it is lighter. So I guess maybe that would be my only project in the works. I've written a couple persona poems. Um, you know, like I just had one, accepted for publication that's from the persona of Lot's wife that turned into the pillar of salt. Um, I wrote one from the perspective of a fox um, about the end of the, about like when the fox was biting all the people on Capitol Hill Um, and they were calling him, you know, this crazy terrorizing fox. And so I wrote it from the perspective of the fox where like, I'm, I'm the bad one here. Like, have you guys taken a look at yourselves? So then that was kind of a lighter it's still kind of rooting for the end of the world, though, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's hear another poem. All right. So um, this is not lighter, whoever. Um, this is <laughs> very not light, so I'm sorry. Uh, this one is called Motherhood. I read an article that described a mother bear who appeared to grieve after her cub was hit by a car. I'm a mother, too, so I couldn't help but hear the shriek of metal mangling fur and see the bear pace the road where her cub sprawled cooling in a puddle of late afternoon sun. I'm sure she nudged the baby again and again and sobbed a hushed grunt, urging the cub to stand and toddle into the lattice of trees. I imagine she promised fish and berries and hickory nuts when autumn came. She whispered into her cub's stilled ears while the sky unfurled into an ocean of stars. The sky over my house was knife sharp the day my youngest son slipped out of the house and into the pool. My husband found him and swears his eyes were open as he hung suspended in the deep end. My boy whose skin was as blue as his shirt, as blue as that summer sky. I snatched my baby and laid him in a scrap of sunlight, prodded his pliant chest with the heel of one hand. I begged him to cough, to cry, to please, please, please come back. I promised cupcakes and pizza and apple cider donuts when autumn arrived. I kissed breath into my baby's cold lips while the edges of the sky unraveled. It was motherhood again from um, a history of resurrection. Um, so uh, Nate Jacob asks, um, does poetry ever manifest itself to you in the very heat of these emergency room experiences? I mean, it's, it's hard. I don't know. That'd be interesting if it did, does it? 
So I wouldn't say, so in the heat would suggest like, as I'm actively saving somebody's life. And usually if I'm actively trying to save somebody's life, you know, I'm mostly concentrating on that. Um, but I, I have stepped back almost it at times while I'm actively saving somebody's life. And I'm like, well, you know, this might make a good poem, like in the back of my mind. Um, and then I just, the, the shooting I referenced the other day, I actually, I, I could not save this young man's life. He was already dead when he came to me. And all I did was basically pronounce him dead. Nobody had done that yet. Um, but then when I walked out later that night, I was behind some family members who were just softly weeping and they didn't know I was behind them. And I remember hearing the words almost come to me, like walking in the wake of their grief and here, you know, just thinking like, oh my gosh, like I'm the one and I'm the last one who touched their kid. And now they don't know that and I'm behind them. So I actually, I haven't written that poem because I'm being lazy about it, but I actually started to write that poem and, and start to feel images or hear images in my mind, like right during, you know, shortly thereafter mm -hmm. as the shift ended, as I walked to my car. Yeah. I mean, I have to imagine though, it's so intense while things are happening that you probably don't have any like there's sort of like a level of consciousness that doesn't exist probably, right? Like it's being so focused on. Yeah. But to be honest, most mm -hmm. things have already happened before. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times it's everything's just an algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we still get surprised sometimes, yeah. um, but in certain emergencies you do this and then you do that and then you do this and you do that. So I don't have to think all of that much about it. But if somebody is like actively dying and I really think that I can stop it, they, I am pretty dialed in usually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. So um, um, David Hutchinson uh, Tipton asks, um, could you please talk about that trauma as a generative one? It seems like it was, uh, was generative as far as poetry. Does that make sense? Hi, David. We were in the same Edward Hirsch workshop together. Oh, okay. Uh, in Denver. Um, yeah, I mean, so so my trauma with my son, I'm assuming. Yeah, that, I, I think that's what he re he's referencing. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so my son was 21 months old. He's He slipped out of the house. Um, we're good parents. You know, it's just one of those horrible freak accidents. Didn't usually go by the pool. There was a gate, blah, blah, blah. He ended up in the pool somehow. My husband found him. Mm -hmm. And then I heard my husband screaming. I was inside cooking and whatever the sound of the scream he was making and he was screaming my name, I knew at that moment before, just by the sound, what had happened. And my husband's a doctor as well, but I, he just brought him to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just immediately snapped into ER doctor mode, no, not mother mode at all, and just started doing CPR and started thinking like, okay, this doesn't work, then this is going to work. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Like in a very weird I mean, it was good, but mm -hmm. um, robot fashion. And then by the time the medics arrived finally, which was forever, uh, we had him, I had him resuscitated and wrapped in a towel and everything. Um, but I just, like my husband had appropriate responses. He immediately wept. He was immediately feeling all the feelings. I didn't. And I kept on being like, why are you upset? He's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's, it's good. Wow. You know, we ended up having to spend the night at a children's hospital because then he, he had a little issue at the hospital where he didn't do well, but then everything's fine. He made a full and completely miraculous recovery with no sequelae, nothing neurologic, nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, but because I, I shut down so hard, didn't cry, didn't anything. It just, I was really numb. And it really came up. I now looking back, I probably had actual PTSD and it came up as images and I just saw his dead body. I mean, I think I referenced dead babies probably more than a normal person should, but I was there and I saw it again and again and again. And it was actually the last poem that I'll read today was the first poem I believe, well, the second poem I wrote about it. And it was as I put it on paper again and again and again, and you know, most of those poems never made it anywhere that I was able to work through it mm -hmm. and that just really i do believe the act of writing then opened up a kind of wellspring in me yeah. that i was able to see everything as generative um whereas before plus two i have a lot of kids and so i was just always like working or mothering working mm -hmm. mothering um and then i it really became a, re a release to me because both of those things are pretty intense the er and all the mothering um, and being able to 
uh, put things in words. And I've noticed the medical stuff, especially people just really liked for the same reason people like the show ER and all that, because it gives people a glimpse. And, you know, I realized that that was kind of something I could do and, and could do well. And so that kind of became my niche, mm -hmm. but then I can never get too far away from, from drowning kids. My kids jokes like, Oh, you love Simon the best. I'm like, well, no, but he, you know, like I'm contractually obligated to yeah. put in a drowning reference one every three poems, I think. So mm. how, how long was it after that incident that you got into poetry? Like how long was the, the PTSD kind of gap? I mean, honestly, that was 2014. It was probably a year. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe, maybe six months, but I think it was actually a year after. No, I think it was a full year after I started to actually process it. And then to then started to have the words to to say what happened mm -hmm. and was able to process how because you get survivor guilt, you get a lot of really weird things. And then being at work and then seeing people who didn't get their kid back. Mm -hmm. um, it was just a lot of really weird stuff to to work through. And then when I finally had the words to understand, like in my mind, what had happened, then I think I started to really write about it a year later. And then I just never stopped. Yeah. Well, it makes sense to be such a traumatic, you know, it's a, it's a situation worthy of PTSD. It's traumatic just, yeah. just thinking about it as you, you tell the story. Um, do you want to read the next poem? Yes. So this one um, is June 2020. And this was one of the first of my pandemic poems, but was also right after uh, George Floyd. You took them hiking today where the river smells green the way the school kill smelled when you ran beside it in med school, before you married, before you bore the boys and adopted a girl, a brown skinned child who suddenly wore your pale name, back when the only dead body you touched was the one you dissected in anatomy lab, before you intubated the woman already four hours dead when her husband carried her into the waiting room, her eyes wouldn't close but you gave her the benefit of the doubt, and when you moved her tongue aside you felt the chill of it through two sets of gloves. Before a man's tears collected in the pools of his temples when you told him he needed the ventilator and all you could do was comfort him to as all you could do to comfort him was stroke his hair and tell him you would pray. Before your life became masks and goggles and gowns and hairnets and fear which settled in your throat. Before the country convulsed and some of your friends didn't understand why, though you knew it could be your daughter under that knee someday and you needed to write. So you tried to write about an old black cemetery whose advertisements promised undulating hills and tree canopied paths where lawyers and civil war veterans would rest together beneath the willows. But later, when the land became valuable, they quietly raised the graveyard and built a dollar store. Only history would tolerate such a cheap metaphor. The bodies were discovered beneath the parking lot last year and you imagine the dust of pulverized bones riding the wind like seeds and landing in soil made rich with blood. These words are slick and slippery things like the minnows which started between your fingers and the lake behind your childhood home. And while you construct the story you think she needs, those seeds have already taken root in your daughter's wild heart. Tonight, the river scents her hair as she leaps into the pool, silhouetted against the sun's dying embers, arms flung wide as if to say, this too belongs to me. That was June 2022. Um, a few people asked a question about uh, mentors because you have uh, Matthew Lippman, you mentioned as a mentor. Um, and, and folks wanted to know how you came to come across a mentor and, and how that worked. How did, how did, how did you find Where, a mentor? I forgot that part. Yeah. So I'd actually signed up for an online poetry class back when I finally started, had the words and started writing about Simon and realized, oh my gosh, like I got a lot to say here. And again, I need, I need deadlines. I need somebody to force me to do things with writing. Um, so I signed up for, it was like Gotham writers or something, an online uh, class. And Matthew Lippman was actually the teacher of that class. And that was a whole big thing. We'd have an assignment each week, a prompt. And so I started writing through that. And then he, um, then offered his private um, services. And he's, I'm like totally shot Matthew out because he has a, a website. He's fantastic. I'd look him up, very affordable. And he gives you a prompt. He kind of um, gives you a poem, a prompt and uh, writes about it, like, or, to, you know, a little bit of an explanation. Like I imagine a poetry class would be because I've never been in one. 
and then gives you a prompt. And then I'd write throughout the week, I'd send it in and then he would give me kind of edits and ideas back. Mm -hmm. So um, I have seen other poets that do that and have, um, you know, one other workshop I had done years ago, I saw some other poets offer that service. Um, so I would just look at if you, if you have a favorite poet, some of a lot of them do do it mm -hmm. um, and just see if it's something they offer on their website. Um, but that, that was really helpful. Um, and that's just one voice and it's a voice I really, really appreciate and really trust. Uh, but then that's why I've tried to do uh, in all my off time, some workshops. And that's why I went to Denver this summer, um, to do Edward Hirsch's workshop, just to hear another voice. Um, not so much telling me what to do, but just for some more guidance and, and Matthew's actually become a friend. So sometimes now I'll just write it and it's like our way of saying hi as we'll send poems back and forth to each other. Yeah, that's great. Um, and kind of a tangent on that. I was wondering what your, your experience is like straddling both fields that are so unrelated. Um, if like, like what do, do you have trouble sort of finding access into the poetry community as it were? Um, you know, given you don't have the, the time to do submissions as much as people do or conferences, like, you know, all that kind of stuff would seem like it'd be difficult to be. And then and then the other question of that is, is how do the people at the hospital that you work at and, and your colleagues there, do they know about your poems? Do they read them? Do, what do they think about engaging with poetry? So the first part, it, um, the first workshop I did ended up being because of COVID virtual. So it wasn't the full experience. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really a big deal. It was fine. When I was really nervous to go to Denver, one, it was the first time I left my family for a week by myself um, and been by myself for a week. But also just, I was like, I don't know the words. I don't know all the, man, you know, just a lot of big words that go along with poetry and um, all the themes and the authors. And I am, like I said, I read a lot. So I'm, and I, I did have a however many, I graduated in 1998. So that long ago, I was an English major, but I was nervous that I wasn't going to kind of be able to like hold my head up amongst um, these people who knew so much more than I, but at least the workshop I was in, everybody was really warm and, mm -hmm. and kind. And, and Ed was so warm and kind and, you know, and I wasn't like a, like completely ignorant. So, and everybody was really helpful in their workshop edits. Uh, as far as like, yes, lit twit and all that. I tried to get on Twitter and I just like, like I, I just don't have the energy to, to keep up what it takes to get a following on Twitter and all that. Mm -hmm. um, submissions I do in batches when I work, I don't know if I should say this, but when I work my admin job, if I have free time, uh -huh. um, you know, that's, I don't think any of those doctors are watching. I can sometimes get some submissions and then, um, or, you know, at night after the kids go to bed. Mm -hmm. But I, it, it is weird trying to access that. And, but it's also, it's like super, it's my hobby. It's not my job. So I don't feel super pressed if I'm not, you know, wildly successful at all times with it. Mm -hmm. It's more something that brings me joy. Yeah. And then um, my doctors, yeah, some of them know, and some of them have bought my book and have been, you know, they're pretty supportive. Most people are like, I don't know how the heck you do it. I don't know what that is, but good for you. I mean, that's how, you know, most, mm -hmm. most doctors are definitely not in that like super artsy literary world, but they have been nice about it. Yeah. Well, everybody in the, in the chat windows just love your poems. Um, um, like, um, just for example, um, uh, Mario class says, it sounds like you are a master of the flow state, which is how I feel. I mean, reading your poems, if they feel like they just flow out, um, and just so many people are, are so moved by, by your work here. Um, so let's, uh, let's take advantage and, and do another poem. Okay. And this was another, um, COVID poem. This was written probably, this was the winter surge of, uh, 21. So last winter surge when it was getting it, real old, I mean, it's still old, but it was really bad then. I know which stories will impress friends over dinner. I might tell you about the pregnant girl who was shot in the head all those years ago in a Walmart parking lot and the way her husband wailed when I tracked him down in Fallujah and told him the news on a crackling line. Don't worry, it ended happily enough. She learned to walk again and the baby survived. She only occasionally uses a word like milk when she means to say bird. People always demand, tell me the worst thing you've ever seen. So sometimes I tell them about the car filled with teens who thought they could fly and left pieces of their bodies in the trees instead. 
or the woman who delivered her intestines like a baby and the way her husband gazed at her with both love and disgust. Occasionally, I'll mention the mother who shot herself in the mouth and arrived in my trauma room with her eye dangling against her cheek. Her young son found her, but she couldn't be saved. I'm too tired for stories now. Each day spins tales of pregnant women who drown in clotted lungs and leave their babies behind. It's almost boring when patients gasp, is it too late to get the shot? And then I see their smiles on Facebook and the kids in their profile pictures, and I must not be numb enough yet because it all still makes me feel sick. My children ask me to stop talking about work. No one cares about COVID anymore, mom, my oldest mumbles, and it's true. So today I'll tell them a story about our dog who slipped his lead and galloped through the stream behind our house. Mud clung to his white fur and he rolled in the grass when I tried to wash his paws. But I couldn't stay angry when cedar scented the air and the trees were crowns of fire. That was uh, stories I no longer tell. Um, that, that was so interesting, um, that, that line there about nobody cares about COVID anymore. And this, I assume the poem was written a while ago. And we're still in the state where, um, you know, I, I assume you still deal with it, you know, a lot and uh and yet we're kind of moved on so it's almost like does it feel like salt in the wound or something to like i mean you had to deal with it when it was at its most intense and in you know and, and frightening and then now when the world's moved on you can't yeah and it it is not as bad as it was so we've been like kind of like a constant dull roar mm -hmm. i think it's never really gone down low again where we are it's just kind of you know, X amount of people in the hospital. Um, but it's not, it's not like at the beginning and then the middle, the first surge, whatever that was 20 to 21. Uh, and then last winter surge where people were dying left and right. People were needing the ventilator left and right. Um, and then like that, that story, you know, it really, everyone was already over. It. I guess that was late last fall. Everyone was already over it. And that was before the surge that almost took us out because the Om Omicron surge last winter almost took us out. It was just so horrible. And the frustrating thing for me, more than people not caring, whatever, you don't care, that's your problem that, you know, it's your choice. I don't even care. Um, was people like actually telling me that I was lying mm -hmm. or that it wasn't true. And that, that was salt in the wound. And there's still people I'll be like, well, I don't know. We, my hospital is really close to the airport. So we have, we have airport people all the time. Anybody has a, a medical emergency in the airport, they come to me. And this guy was getting ready to go on a flight to a very long flight, very far away to go on a very long cruise. And he was sick and he had COVID. And I'm, I'm like, you have COVID? He's like, oh, I thought so, but I didn't want to check. You know, and he was like, really sick. And so that part's like, oh, okay. That's just good to know that all these people are just now like taking it all around mm -hmm. in the airport. Yeah. So that gets here, you know. So I'm still like, you know, kind of a hermit. I mm -hmm. we get out, we travel, but we're real careful about it. Yeah. But That's at this true. point, we're kind of just like, oh, okay. I mean, like, I'm not going to talk to you about getting vaccinated. Are you vaccinated? I hope you are. Okay. Well, that's fine. You're not. That's fine. You mm -hmm. know, that is your choice at this point. I'm not going to even waste like my my mental energy or my worry. I will take good care of anybody that comes in. I will hope the best for everybody that comes in, you know, and mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of how we, or the, me at least, how I had to deal with, with all of this. Just don't tell me it's fake. I can handle anything but somebody telling me it's fake. Yeah. It's hard to believe people still, still say that after, I mean, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, they do. Yeah. Um, so on the, we talked about, um, you know, sort of when you find time to make poems and what generates them, but, but what is your process actually like? Like how much do you, do you journal to start and then craft them into poems? Do they spill out in this form and you just let them be? Um, do you edit and revise very much? How, what is your actual process when it comes to engaging with the poems on the page? So I would say the first thing that happens, like for instance, when I left that shooting and I, I felt like I was walking in the wake of their grief, that's like a, an image or a thought that stuck with me. So I put that in the notes in my, on my phone. Um, and so if you were to open up my notes folder, some of them, I unfortunately I have no idea what they mean because I never wrote about it. So I'll just have all these random, you know, I'll be like the, the, the dead fox that's there, the thing I saw, the, you know, such and such happened. So my notes folder just has all these different thoughts or a phrase that comes to me. 
Um, and then most of it, I would say 80% of the poem happens in my mind before I ever have a chance to go um, write it down. So that those will be the times that I'm walking the dog. Um, and I, I hike in the woods, that's my major exercise almost every day. Mm -hmm. So if I'm hiking in the woods and it's quiet and I'm not with my friend, um, I'll just start working things over in my mind and start kind of hearing things. And if it's really, really good, I'll pull out my phone while I'm hiking, but mostly it's just like repetitive and I'll remember it. And then when I finally get to a computer, it does spill out pretty quickly then. And I don't try to um, line break punctuation, anything at the time. Sometimes I'll just write it in a paragraph and then I'll go through and start moving things around line breaking um, and then lately, you know, trying some tricks that I learned, which is with stanzas, mm -hmm. um, trying to pay more attention to my lineation and things like that. Um, and then my, my husband, who is also a physician, but is also a phenomenal writer is actually usually my first reader. Um, and he, he was the editor of his uh, high school newspaper. So he's just this great editor and he'll usually read it. And I'll usually send it to my sister and my dad. Um, both of whom love me. So, I mean, all those people are like, kind of, I don't know how objective they can be, um, but I can tell if something's going to land or not kind of by reactions. And then maybe I'll clean it up a little more. And, and that's usually about it. Unless I, sometimes I send it to Matthew. Um, but sometimes I just send it out at that point. Mm -hmm. um, you've mentioned that workshop with the line breaks a few times. And, and what do you think that the best tip you learned from there? Is there something that stands out that you can pass along? Um, well, just if you look in this book, like, and again, this book was published and it's been written probably a year or so. Some of my line breaks as far as where the, what word the line ends on, you know, now if I look back and I'm like, oh my gosh, why did I end on that word? And just using kind of when you break the line, the most vibrant word, the most interesting word, you know, something that's going to make the, eye, you know, that makes sense. And that's natural, what makes the eye want to move. And so each, you know, cut each line is a, a moment in and of itself. Um, and then also the other thing I'd been working on for that workshop was either putting things in couplets or tercets or, um, you know, four lines, just different things based on, you know, I wrote a more biblical poem and I think I did that more like verses and like four, uh, four line stanzas. Um, if I rewrote that motherhood poem, I think I would do it in couplets. There's just things, you know, just to kind of make the, the, the thought a little more discreet rather than this kind of pours out of me in this, um, almost stream of consciousness, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is just a lot to take in. Yeah. Well, I love it. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't want to argue with you about <laughs> it anyway, but I love the style. Yeah, um, it's you. so great. Um, so there's, I guess, two more quick questions, um, from the audience. So, um, somewhere somebody had asked about sharing or, or if you're, if your children, yeah, it was J um, Jamie T asked uh, if your children ever read your work. Is that something, especially with so many poems about them and that ex drowning experience, have they read the, the book and, and your work? Uh, I, I doubt any of them. For, yeah. yeah. Um, I doubt any of them has read the whole book. Uh, my one who would, you know, I have a 17 year old who, you know, not going to be a doctor, not, doesn't love to read. <laughs> so like, but super smart. I have to give a shout out to that kid. He's super smart. He wants to do marketing. Um, so they just always like, mom's writing another poem about Simon. <laughs> that's their, that's kind of my kid's attitude. Mm -hmm. Now, Simon, who is the one who probably has the most poems written about him, he is probably my budding writer and he has read some of these poems. Um, and you know, just kind of like, yeah, I mean, he knows he drowned, he knows he died. And, you know, he, so in, in his way, it kind of makes him feel special, even though they're so intense to read about it. So yeah, that the kids, the kids, some of them have read them, some of them haven't, they all want to be like, but did you write one about me? Do I have one? And I do. I, I think everybody has at least been in one poem. So you know, <laughs> I love them all. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Um, and then it was really, really quick question, but um, Dick Westheimer asked if there's an alternative to Amazon to purchase your book. Is that, where, where's the best place to buy it? So I don't think there is. I think there the small, very indie, small publisher. Um, he had mentioned another website, but I don't think he's selling it on that website. So right now it is only on Amazon mm -hmm. um, or, or me, actually, if you go to, I have a whole huge box of them. And so if you just want to buy one from me, if you go to my website and do the contact, um, I can do a signed copy and send it to you. So I guess, yeah, I'll, I'll rep myself. That's the alternative. Uh, buy well, there me. you go. That's even better. Yeah. So, so yeah. go to our website, get a signed copy. Um, like I have right here. Um, 
So, so what's up next? Do you have other books in the works? Are you thinking of putting new manuscripts together? I mean, you mentioned, you know, you crafting poems a little more. Uh, are you, where are you in your, your process as far as like what you have in the, in the coffer? So I, I mean, I have a whole bunch that are out in the submiss- submittable world right now. Um, you know, that I'm waiting, you know, just have had a few new ones I've worked on this summer. I think I said, I only wrote two or three this summer. And one of them I haven't even finished because it was somebody not terribly close to me that died, but it was kind of an ugly death that I'm in proximity to. And so I had to like, I started working on it right when it happened. Then I had to kind of put it to the back burner because it was, it was a hard poem to write. Mm -hmm. So I still have that one on the burner in, in my, yes, in my dreams, I'm working on a second manuscript. Um, This was more a chat book. I really am I have a full manuscript in mind. I kind of know the poems I want to put in. As you know, it's a lot of work. Like just, you know, going through and picking everything out. And then just, I'm really getting stuck on the order, you know. So I probably just need to print everything out that I'm thinking about, go through and just start messing around and, and putting in order. So yeah, it. one of my goals, it was... My 2022 goal was to get a book published, which I got, which was this. And so I guess maybe my 2023 goal will be to uh, have a full length because I think I have enough poems for it. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of um, cleaning things up and getting the right order and just getting to the business, like the work part. Yeah. Um, So, so since this book is, is so much about death. Um, and it made me just think about how we we don't really engage with death as a society. You know, it's like something we don't really talk very much about. Um, and having to work in this and and write with this about this topic so much, do you think that gives you more of an appreciation for life? Like like, do you you know are your days blessings because you know what can happen and and the whole chronicle of awful accidents that that come through the room? Oh yeah, totally. I actually I think my my job mostly has always just led me to keep my accounts very, very short. I'm not petty. I'm, I'm not going to hold grudges. Um, I am pretty long suffering and patient, like, especially again, five kids. Okay. There's a lot of chaos in my life. And after almost losing my one child and then seeing everything that can happen with, with life overall, I try not to get that stuff. to to get to me. And I do have a great appreciation for life. And for, you know, my big escape, because people get worried, like, oh, you know, I always felt like I'd tell Matthew, like, I'm totally not suicidal. Like, I'm totally healthy. I'm totally fine. I mean, as doctors, we compartmentalize. Obviously, I put it on the paper because I'm, I'm like, okay at it. And, you know, I can craft something good out of it, but I don't sit around thinking about death all day or anything. Mm -hmm. Um, Hardly ever. I mostly just enjoy the life I have, enjoy the kids I have. And then my big escape is I love nature so much, like being outside, being in the mountains, being by a river, hiking, even in like, you know, the woods of Annapolis, much less when I get to get out West, like I did in the summer, brings me so much joy. Um, and so that's where I would go and decompress. And my husband loves to hike too. So like the happiest thing we can do together is go on a hike. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm able to enjoy those moments and find such, such happiness in the beauty of this world and the beauty of my kids. And, you know, life is super hard, but I don't sit around like thinking about it. I'll put it on the paper and then be regular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's just uh, been great talking to you. It's so inspiring. Um, you know, to hear both through the poems and just through what you have to say. Um, I don't know. It's just a, a wonderful thing to be able to talk to you. Do you want to finish out with one last poem? Sure. This is like such a sad little like thing to leave on, but you know, this is the one I picked. So um, it's called The Taste of Grief. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from the people and ate grass like the ox. That's the epigraph. When I saw my youngest son lying still in blue, I tasted grief. It's flavor like earth, ancient and familiar. So I tore into it, gnawing like Nebuchadnezzar until my teeth began to break and I realized I was chewing stone. Then somehow my son took a breath and opened his eyes. Sensing my salvation, I rolled the stone under my tongue in order to spare my teeth. While the days stayed light and long, it was easy to forget its taste for I filled my mouth with sun-worn blackberries and harvested tomatoes. But now, as the days contract, the sky hovers bruised and cold, and the garden lies fallow, I taste it yet. When it is dark, and I awaken from the dream with hands cupped beneath my chin to catch my falling teeth, I taste it yet. 
For having tasted grief, I cannot spit it out. I can only hide the stone under my tongue and wonder when my teeth will finally shatter. Yeah, that was the taste of grief. Again, those were uh, poems from a history of resurrection. Uh, Rachel, thanks again for being a guest. It's just been wonderful talking to you. Um, hope you keep keep writing these and, and we get to keep sharing them and learning from them. Thank you. Yeah, Thank take you care. So Thank you. Bye. Um, yeah, that was Rachel Malalu. Uh, her book is um, uh, A History of Resurrection. You can find it at Rachel-Malalu. It's spelled like it is on the screen right here. Um, uh, where to go? Rachel Malou. It's M A L L A L I E U. So uh, Rachel hyphen Malou dot com. Find the book there. And uh, like Rachel said, you can email the book or, or email her um, and buy a copy, a signed copy directly from her. So go ahead and do that. Hope that hope they come flooding in, um, but not taking up too much of your time, I guess, as well. Um, but uh, yeah, wonderful stuff there. We're gonna take a quick break and go to the open lines. Now the open lines are. Um, I will put this up on the screen. I mean, if you'd like to join us, only if you'd like to share a poem, um, you can follow the uh, invite link, which is right here. I'm going to deploy that onto Facebook and YouTube. Um, so join us there only if you'd like to share a poem, though. But first, email your poem to openmic, that's open M I C at rattle.com. Um, and uh, if you don't have a show poem to share, though, um, feel free to sit tight right where you are. Um, you can share poems, though, uh, that you've been pu had published recently. We have the prompt for this week, which to, was to write a persona poem based on a painting portrait, um, that courtesy of uh, Linda Nemec Foster last week. Um, or you can send a Poets Respond poem, too. Uh, whatever you'd like to do, if you'd like to share a poem, uh, send it to openmic at rattle.com and join me over on the uh, Zoom, which is right here. The links are being deployed. So join me over there. But if you, if you don't want to uh, share a poem, just sit right where you are and enjoy them on YouTube or Facebook. And um, I'm going to take a quick break, and I will be right back with more poetry. And we're back. Thanks so much for your patience. Like I mentioned, the prompt for this week was to, um, this was from Linda Nemec Foster. It's a bit of a long description, but let's hear it. Using online resources about visual art. Select a painting that's a portrait. It doesn't have to be a famous person that's the subject of the painting, for example, Mona Lisa or Van Gogh, only that the portrait intrigues you. Uh, in your poem, assume the voice of that person and imagine a backstory for your other self. How does it feel to be looked at all the time? Is there anything in the background of the painting that may offer a glimpse into this other person's life you're trying to imagine? In writing persona poems, we not only write in the perspective of the first person, but we try to totally assume the voice of the other. The thoughts, feelings, and sensibilities. Lose yourself and let your imagination take off. That was uh, what uh, Linda Nemec Foster shared with us last week. And I'm not a huge... Um, you know, I'm not an art history person. I don't know a whole lot about different paintings and stuff. So I went to random, I think it's random hyphen com, and they have a, um, uh, a gallery of things where you can get a random painting. And I flipped through and came across this really striking painting. It kind of gave me goosebumps a little bit, just the way this is, um, um, uh, what's the, Ma Manet or uh, Manet, I guess you'd say. I didn't know there's a difference between Manet, Manet and Monet. Actually, that's how bad I am at art. But um, this this painting right here, which is um, Luncheon on the Grass, uh, let me put it on the screen. 
um, just the way that the figure in there is just staring like into your soul. Like she's, it's, it's the first time I've ever experienced a painting where it felt like the person was like looking out at you. It is intense in that painting. And so I try to capture that with this uh, triolet. So here's my poem for the week. This is a triolet on the grass after Manet. Look at me, you fool. Look at me as if it weren't. A, uh, let me start over. Triolet in the grass after Manet. Look at me, you fool. Look at me as if it weren't a look at you. My eyes are clear. What do they see? Look at me, you fool. You look at me. Our days lie scattered in the grass's sea. Anything you ask, I'll answer true. Look at me, you fool, you. Look at me as if it weren't a look at you. There's my triolet on the grass for this, uh, this portrait of someone staring intently into your soul. So I hope you enjoyed that. Let's see what everybody else has. Let's go to Angela Gartner first. Um, hey, Angela. Oh, hang on one second. How do you... There you go. I couldn't find the uh, unmute button. So uh, so yeah. how you doing, Angela? Good. Um, real good. It's Labor Day. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, so what do you have that you'd like to share? Why two poems? I don't know if you have time for two. Um, you know, I was thinking we should probably just keep it to one from now on because I have to cram it to two hours and it's been a little hard lately. So um, for the audio version. So let's just keep it to one. Uh, but which one would you rather do? You know, I'd probably rather do the hush judge or a shrug. OK, yeah, that sounds good. So what is the uh, what's backstory? What's this about? Well, it's so funny that uh, Rachel was talking and she was wonderful, by the way, like as a mom, like I can totally relate to her. Um, just amazing. So awesome. But when I this is a, a COVID poem, actually, mm -hmm. that a couple um, I wrote like about a month ago. And it's funny because we just had like a COVID case in our own house. And there's so many people I know that are starting to get COVID again, especially with the school year starting. So, and it's just still that stigma, like when you have COVID or you're wearing a mask and this is kind of like my experience, uh, you know, with that, you know, on your back, like, you know, you feel like people are behind you, like whispering, you know, like, oh, <laughs> so this is just that. Okay. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's going around everywhere around here. Like we had so many things canceled and our softball league, like half the team didn't show up one day because it, it just seems like it's everywhere. And uh, so let, let's hear it. Hush, judge, or a shrug. I walked into the drugstore to the nail polish aisle, trying to find a color to match the mood. My nose itches with the mask on. I know what else I need the at-home tests. Go past the cold pills, the pink lady shavers, bag gummy bears, and boxes of rubber gloves. The clerk points out the almost empty shelf. I was traveling out of town, I told her. I have no symptoms. There's a line of people behind me, each wondering if me is the lone carrier. I tried to sneeze quietly. I dropped my keys in a hurry to leave. In the sun, I breathe a sign of relief. Oh, excellent. That was a hush judge or shrug. And you know what? I changed my mind. We have, um, we have plenty of time. Let's just do both poems. We'll, have a, we'll go back to a, a two-page two, uh, max or something. But, um, but let's hear the other one, too, because I don't want to miss it. <laughs> okay. Well, this one is a Labor Day poem, so. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's get that. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's. How we labor as Americans. Moms in their hospital gowns to see little round faces and pink toes, pajama pants and dress shirts, a fluffy pet that bats the keyboard when the light, when the camera light is on. The customer yells for one more pour, then drops shiny copper on the table. The horse's tail whips back and forth. Its head is down as it pulls and chews green grass next to the barn of cows who are milked before dawn. Dirty dishes with food stuck on the ends, left in the sink next to the dishwasher. The sunflower garden is full of weeds. The ball bounces into the glove where he is waiting for it to come. A wet cheek, a quiet place to speak, 
breathing falls short on the monitor, the labor stops, it's over. Excellent. How we labor as Americans. Great portrait of, uh, of Labor Day. Thanks so much for sharing that, Angela. Thank you. Have a great night, Tim. Yep. Thanks. You too. Thanks. Uh, we'll just go in order of uh, how they appear on my screen this week. Let's go to Carla Schwartz next. Carla? I'm unmuted, right? I'm unmuted. There you go. You're good. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Good to see you, okay, Carla. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Glad to be here. Thank you. Um, so I um, I wrote a hyphen oh. for tonight's prompt, mm -hmm. and it was based on um, the birth of Venus by uh, Botticelli. I'll put it up um, on the screen for everybody at home so, right now. Yeah, this is a you know another famous. This is one I've seen before. Which uh, I'm not for, surprised. Not surprised. Me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not surprised. So here's the poem. Are you showing the the picture first? Yeah, or? yeah, we're showing the picture okay. first here. So for people, it, it you know who haven't seen it, it's um it's a Venus kind of emerging out of a clamshell with angels around and things like that. Right, and it's called the birth of Venus. So it actually, she supposedly was born as an adult, which I refer to as in this poem. Today I have a craving for an obstacle so I can break it. I dare you to stand in my way. In my opinion, clothing, sad but practical. Not sure where I learned this as I was born yesterday. I miss the child I never was, the child who runs naked through the waves without a worry or care, the child whose naked, bold beauty, private for the world to share. I want to go into the water where I can hide my naked self, but perch on this shell, I haven't yet learned to swim. Nude on a shell, a tangle of rug thick hair, embarrassment yours. Uh, excellent. Today I have a craving for an obstacle so I can break it. Great, great poem. Thanks so much for sharing that, Carla. Oh, thank you. And, um, and I had one more that I just emailed you. Yeah, sure. I have an Equinox Sun. So the Equinox is right. coming up, isn't it? Yeah, the Equinox is coming yeah. up. And this is a poem from my new book, chapbook called Signs of Marriage. Uh, yeah, I love that title still. I think about it all oh, the time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Equinox Sunset. Too wind weary to take a boat out for sunset. We amble across the thin section of island and the pink light filtered, light filtered through the trees lures us west, as if the deep equinoxal tones make music, a song only the sun knows when summer breaks into autumn, when like the leaves, like the leaves, cloud and sky display shades of red, yellow. The song we had forgotten rose through our bones, and each time we turn to leave, the glow reflected on a tree draws us back to the sun. Excellent. Equinox sunset. Thanks so much for sharing that, Carla. Thank you. Yeah, Bye -bye. always a pleasure. Um, next up, it will be uh, Dick Westheimer. Hey, Tim. Hey, Dick. How are you doing tonight? Good. Oh, I love the interview tonight, and and I hope I hope those poetry classes don't uh, mess up Rachel's voice too much. Yeah, I I I, I don't know. I didn't want to like say too much about it, and you know, but I just love her voice as it is. I, like, don't like it's such a distinctive voice already, and comes out so clearly and in, in such a classic kind of rattle way. Um, I just loved. It. I mean, the book was so moving to me reading it this afternoon. Um, but what is it that you would like to share? Um, well, I sent you two poets, short Poets Respond poems this week, um, Anger Management and the Venn Diagram of Stalin, Melania, and Me. <laughs> okay, well, let's, I'll pull them up. Um, do you want to explain uh, with the first one, which whatever you want to read first? Yeah, I'll do Anger Management first. Okay. Uh, this was, I, actually, I'll, I'll read my, um, what I said in my note to you, uh, which was, uh, this was not the poem I wanted to write. I set out to write a, Light uh, as um, 
a lighthearted as a way, way to sanely respond to Trump's malfeasance whistling past the gra graveyard. I ended up dredging through memories of my own anger issues as a younger man. WTF poetry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, and okay. it's about it's about the folders. Mm -hmm. So Okay, let's hear it. Anger management. Empty folders among items filled in FBI search of Mar-a-Lago. That was from Fox News. The Twitterverse ferments speculation. What was in the empty folders? Joking folks say the Colonel's secret recipe, a health care plan, Ivanka's prenup. The more sober suggest sold secrets. But I think it was the shadow of friends never made, the heavy size of a lonely man, fear. And what does it look like? A rose petal, edges curled and brown, the five of cups to row, one goblet spilled, turned upside down, a napkin stained with blood, a single tear. I have a folder filled with similar small ghosts that I pull from my drawer to remind me of the raging game I played long ago when I was the angry king, hurling chess pieces at everything. Yeah, great ending there. When I was the angry king, hurling chess pieces at everything. Anger Management uh, by Dick Westheimer. And then what is the uh, the other one, Dick? Uh, the, the other one... Um, uh, really was prompted by the um, the flooding in Pakistan mm. and just sort of the the uh, overall calamitous summer we've had with, you know, with pile pylons, you know, what, you know, we had obviously what's happened in Texas and Mississippi and just it, it seems the numbers of catastrophic events are um increasing and i saw an image of some people trudging through their streets in um i forget what town in pakistan mm -hmm. but they were picking up shreds of wood hmm. and gathering them and, and so it was sort of that image that that moved me you know what were the, why were they gathering them so the venn diagram of stalin melania and me and the epigraph is from the graphic in the back of Melania's jacket worn when she was visiting separated children, separated from their parents, uh, the Texas-Mexico border that said, I really don't care, do you? Stalin was right when he called one death a tragedy, a million, a statistic, or a thousand, or 33 million wading in relentless waters, their homes now one with the mud. But what about that one man reaching into the Rage River to gather flotsam he could bundle to make a raft for his child? That is calamity. And the man nearby fishing for door jams and shattered rafters to frame a lean-to for his family? Tragedy. I've taught my kids that sharing is caring, but all I've shared is my carbon-chugging life drunk on power. I'm not about to change. I Google how to help and write a few sodden checks to the right NGOs. This is sharing, so I must care, but not enough to sit with a mother whose child has been swept away, to remain with her until her grief subsides, which is forever, to cook for her, to hold her when she needs holding. So I don Melania's coat and admire her honesty. Yeah, powerful poem as always, Dick. That was great. The Venn diagram of Stalin, Melania, and me. Thanks for sharing that and for uh, sharing the other poem too. Always a pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Yep, bye bye. bye. Uh, next up is uh, Katie Dozier Moshman. Hi. Hey, Katie. Great to see you. How you doing? Good. I'm. I'm going to be doing something kind of funny. I'm going to be on my cheap computer, reading from my nice computer that I can't get to work. So. Okay. Well, that is. Uh, that'll work out though. Okay. Um, so, what is it that you want to share? The thread thread poem that ends with hugs. Yeah, this is going to be a poem that I posted on Twitter, and just sorry, now I'm having an issue again. But I'll get there in the end. Okay. Is there okay. anything I want to say about it before you read? Um, 
Just that I like posting poems on social media and it's fun. And if you're on Twitter, then come t- find me and I'll be your friend on Twitter. <laughs> like, what, what is your Twitter handle? It is at Katie underscore Dozier. Okay. So Katie underscore I'm Dozier. starting with the plug, you know, getting that yeah, out of the way early. Of the way. Yeah. <laughs> and I can screw up reading the poem, you know? <laughs> okay. So this is thread poem that ends with hugs. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to be looking at you guys, but that's what I can do right now. So, okay. Thread poem that ends with hugs. In a stainless steel bowl that reflects my face, I smush ground beef through my fingers, ooze in a whisked egg. How funny cavemen would find me, shaping flesh into suns for fire. I broke into a pool. My body caught the chlorine, their particles. Naked as me, I was as naked as them. The only proof that I'm not water is this thread of words. Some letters die and come back as absidarians, helix paper straws of poetry. Spun around a cone, pink sugar clouds. The burgers are rare on the grill. How the raw molecules of white dare to reach for the red and every bean at this barbecue is stretching out. Yeah, excellent. That was great. Thread poem that ends with hugs. Uh, Katie Dozier, thanks so much for uh, being a guest. And, and Thanks. Great show. I'm really enjoying it. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. All right. And then uh, next up will be uh, Barbara Tyler. Like a first time caller yes. this time. Yes, I am. Hey, Barbara. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. And, uh, and where are you calling from? Um, from Texas, East Texas. Awesome. And so um, what is it that you'd like to share? Um, the poem is called Third Verse. Okay. Yep. I got it right here. And uh, is there anything you want to say about it before you share it? No, it's pretty self-explanatory. Okay. Well, let's hear it then. Third verse. Whenever you're Okay. Third verse. On the way to the funeral, a flood of fond memories pours from my husband about his best friend from high school, a man now gone, a man I never liked and who never liked me in return. We would cross three states to pay our respects to his widow and children, children old enough to not need a father, but young enough to miss one gone too soon. As we drive, we listen to a short, sad song, a Linda Ronstadt tune we keep repeating as my husband recounts good times and shenanigans he and youthful buddies got into. They were the popular kids in their day, demigods, I never ran with. Over the years, he and his best friend kept up with each other, occasionally calling to let the other know of some milestone in their lives until one called to inform the other of cancer. And here we are, two years later, crossing another state, wishing for the sake of those left behind the melancholy song playing over and over had one more verse. Today, my husband has quite twice called me best friend. Oh, very touching poem. Thanks so much for sharing that. That was third Thank verse. You. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us. Hope you can join us again soon. Oh, I will. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thanks so much. It worked great, too. Thanks. All right. Let's uh, go next to Mike Bales. Hey, Hi, Mike. Katie. How are you doing tonight? Pretty good. Uh, writing for this and that. I'm hoping to get a submission out tomorrow. Excellent. Um, I'm, maybe I should have sent you a link to the painting. I did a painting of, uh, I did a poem about Picasso's painting Guernica, uh, which can... is kind of rare. It's all black and white and gray when you usually paints in colors. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. I can I like... pull it up. I'm trying to find your, um... oh, there's your poem. Okay. Yeah, let me pull up Guernica really quick in case people aren't familiar with it. One of the most, fainting, f- most famous paintings, Guernica. I like his weird shapes. And this is kind of people writhing after a bombing. It's a true painting of terror. Yeah, and here I'll use this picture because I I never knew how big it was. It is just huge um, until recently. Like I said, I'm not a um, an art scholar or anything, but um, this is just a tiny portion of the of the panel. Uh, but you can see in this in this photo up here, uh, people standing next to it. Um, it's very very big Guernica. So um, let's hear uh, hear this poem. Okay, it's called, This is My Guernica. This is my Guernica. I am but one figure in a corner of the room, crying out as bombs from other nations rain from clouds. I am but one figure on a canvas 
of blacks and whites and grays, a collage of, of mis dismembered figures, a dead soldier, a screaming mother, the body of her child, smoke and flames. I am but one figure, an artist's dream, a painting on display at the world's galleries, the village's grief. I am but one figure, a story told without embellishment, resistance against nationalists, recollections of images of a people who once stood proud. Excellent. Great poem as always, Mike. It's always great to hear from you. Thank and uh, yeah, yeah. Sure. Thanks for sharing. I've that. got another one if you got time. Yeah, it's sure. Let's do it. Although people are, I mean, we'll still do it, but I'm going to say it's cool to see people uh, coming in later now. So, um, so we're um, going to have a, a good full open mic. But yeah, let's hear the other one too. This was a contribution to a book put out by the Midwest Writing Center called These Interesting Times about 2020. Mm -hmm. Did you email it to me? No, I didn't. I okay. just decided off for the moment to do it. <laughs> okay. Um, and it's called Over Drinks. After the touchdown is scored, the patron at the end of the bar says a man just died of COVID and he lived do just down the street. The man just down the street was the son of someone who frequented the bar but I'd never seen his face. The patron orders another round of drinks. On another screen, the show Jeopardy plays on Alec Trebek's last stand. We shout out guesses of what is the question to the answer while keeping social distance. Another screen, screen shows a knee on a victim's neck, and the answer is for over eight and a half minutes. Unanswered questions lead to riots in the streets and the shouts that Black Lives Matter. Someone says the buffalo wings are good while the running back on screen is tackled and the, and, a, and the man raises his arms and cheers. The waitress who works her tips gathers change so she can buy a birthday gift for her daughter in grade school and wonders how to filter the news. Excellent, yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. Mike, what was that called again? Uh, over drinks. Over drinks. That's right. Yeah. Thanks it's so much. It's a processing COVID poem. Uh huh. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Always a pleasure, Mike. Uh, next up is uh, Jennifer Elise Wang. Hey. Hey, Jen. How are you doing tonight? Uh, I'm good. So um, I'm actually pulling up an old poem because <laughs> this week I've been busy. I'm doing a featured reading uh, tomorrow. Oh, congratulations. Cobalt Poets. Where is that? Yeah. Uh, it's a the virtual cobalt cafe uh facebook group cobalt poets which oh, i learned awesome. about thanks to dick so <laughs> yeah, it's a nice, yeah. Like, I mean, way we, to connect. We love, yeah we love that it's a great series yeah <laughs> but I, I do write a lot based on artwork um but it, what's interesting is the the persona part was always the, <laughs> the thing that i don't usually do i'm usually an outsider mm -hmm. like watching but uh i did find one that uh is one of the characters in uh the hunt of the unicorn tapestries um, I was particularly fascinated that they basically use a virgin woman as bait in the story. So uh, it's from her point of view. Uh -huh. And so a uh, unicorn. Okay. I had been drawn to you, much like men who only see us for that one precious quality they desire to possess, a trophy paid for by blood. And it seems you cannot resist Hesitatingly, you seek to touch what no man has ever touched. Long platinum hair, slender limbs, sad sapphire eyes. It's like staring into a mirror when I look at you. I see an image of immaculateness, immaculateness imprisoned. Excellent. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Jen. And uh, let me pull up. I, I should have done it before you read. Let me pull up the uh, Hunt of the Unicorn Tapestry so people watching. Uh, yeah, there's on multiple pieces. So uh, the one that I picked, the pieces are called, I think, like the unicorn is lured oh, by yeah. the virgin. Yeah, I've seen like these that. too. Let me uh, let me just show people. This is the, yeah, those are beautiful. I love those. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Jen. Excellent poem. Uh, very cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. All right, and next up, we're going to go to Nate Jacob. I don't know if this is the first time Nate's been on. He's always in the comments. It's great to see. Uh, I think you've been on like once or twice before, right, Nate? I've, I've tried before. Uh -huh. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you sound great. Okay. <laughs> well, the first time I ever tried, I couldn't be heard, so oh, okay. it traumatized me, kept me off the screen. Uh, perfect. Well, it's perfect now. You, you look great. Okay. You sound great. Uh, what do you have well, that you'd like to share? <laughs> shucks. I did. I sent you a poem. <laughs> Open mic. I got it. Uh, Vincent's Hidden Face. 
Vincent's hidden face. It's based on the Starry Night, uh-huh. uh, and there's no actual portrait in it. But uh, one day I was staring at the details and saw a face within it. Interesting. I sent I mean, you a, uh, I sent you a zoomed in. Oh, okay. Oh, I think it didn't. Let's see. Does it? Did it not come through? Yeah. The the it came as like a text content. I think it's it was just code. Kind of, but All I'll right. try to find a good really quickly. Okay. Uh, I'll try to find a good a good big photo. There was some, uh, th- there's been talk uh, about Vincent being treated for the wrong disease. Mm-hmm. Here you go. <laughs> Katie's got the picture. Uh, okay. Yeah, there it is. Uh, well, we can't switch to Katie. I have it up here. So where's the, okay. where's the face? I have it up for the YouTube folks. So just to the left of the church building, there's a yellow window. Uh-huh. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's been talked about that yellow is a sign of some of the psychoses that Vincent might have been suffering from. Uh-huh. Very interesting. Uh, you've been treated with digitalis, uh-huh. which uh, actually causes your vision to turn things yellow. Oh, really? Very interesting. Yeah. I mean, just such a beautiful painting. I mean, everybody knows Vincent Van Gogh. Even I do. <laughs> but, uh, so I, I kind of wrote myself into it. Uh-huh. Um, that's what this poem is. Okay, let's hear it. I have it up uh, whenever you're ready. Vincent's hidden face. I see you all leaning in as close as proctors allow searching for signs of life while counting brush strokes and pondering yellowed psychoses. We make eye contact, most of us, but I'm the only one to know it. I am not the face you seek, not the look you want returned, not the villager waiting below, to the point you, to point you toward the truth, which for all others has laid hidden within or below, or perhaps even behind the eternal starry night. Excellent. Yeah, that was Vincent's hidden face. I, I'm going to have to like zoom in really good on that painting and, and see. I could, I, I could, I could see exact. the window. I see what you're talking about. It looks just like me. Does it? Oh wow. No. No. I... <laughs> no. <laughs> no. But there I, there I put myself. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you. it's great to finally see you and have you on the show. It's, it's really you have great right. questions during the, uh, you know, in the chat windows and stuff. Um, it's good to see. Thanks. you. Love poetry. Yeah. Thanks awesome. Lot. Thanks. Hope to see you again soon. Well. Yep. Bye. Uh, and next up, let's go to Sean Hu Lee, another poet who's been on before, but I've never seen before. Hey, Sean Hu, how are you doing? Very good. I sent you two poems, but uh, I would like to read the first, uh, the second one first. That is a better one, in my opinion. Okay, sounds good. Let's see. Okay, so this is uh, the smell, right? Yes. Okay. Can, I, can you hear me? I can, yep, yep. Yes. The smell. The smell is what's absent, invisible, forgotten. Queen of the night flowers. Its loneliness swing in the moonlight. The smell comes from my dream, or it comes from the dusk, to feed my departure from wind chimes, from father's molded winter coat from perilla leaves, from spoons and sea sprays, from the knife blinded by use, on the gravity of moors, on the shadow, on the skin, on spin. In the droplets of fog appears the face of smell in the fragments of heaven lake upholding high clouds, lies hidden smell of untold stories. The smell remembers, the smell dances. Oh, that was beautiful. Thanks so much for sharing that, John. Who That was uh, the smell. And then you have so another have, poem too, yeah. So I have a photo of that, uh, the queen of the night. Oh, I didn't scroll down far enough. Yeah, here it is. I'll put on screen for the YouTube watchers. Queen of the night, this is a night blooming um, series. I, yes. And then the below is the Heaven Lake. Oh, wow. Yeah. So if, if anybody's still watching on Zoom, make sure to go over to YouTube and see these uh, beautiful pictures. Heaven Lake, um, located yeah. on the border between China and Korea. That is, I want to go there. <laughs> That's for sure. That's where I'm from. Is it? Yes. Oh, wow. Like near this lake? <laughs> yeah, it's almost uh, 30, 30 minutes from my home. Oh, wow. That is, a, I can't even imagine being somewhere that beautiful. Have you been like on a raft or a boat or anything on that? Is that possible? <laughs> No, it is, it is, it is a crater lake. It is a volcano lake. Mm-hmm. It is on the top of the mountain, yeah. 7,000 7, miles. 
Oh, wow. Okay, and let's see. Uh, the other one is about um, the girl with the pearl earring, which um, yes. which most people are probably familiar with, but here it is on the screen. There was a movie about that not too long ago. I know, um, but did you say it's not about that movie? <laughs> okay, so uh, then this uh, your poem is um, a girl with a pearl earring. Yes. Girl with a pearl earring. In the blue of Arctic night, a young girl dons a cerulean turban, her face tender and a tranquil, green eyes quietly looking back, a pearl earring radiant in the air, shaped in a seashell, the pearl ironically large to the age of innocence, her smile mystic, as if she is not smiling, but about to whisper all awake, as if a little butterfly is about to flutter away, wondering about life. Yeah, excellent. Wonderful poems, uh, two of them. Uh, that was by Shan Hu Lee. You can find uh, Shan Hu's work at S H A N U M H U L E E dot com. Shan Hu Lee dot com. Thanks so much for joining us, Shan. It was great to see you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, take care. All right, we have a couple more people, two people left on the Zoom right now. It's uh, Brent Stauffer time. Hey, Tim. Hey, Brent. I love how you sneak in as one of the last people all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I actually like to um, – uh, I, I, I tend to uh, be smoking while uh -huh. I'm sitting out here in the garage, uh -huh. and I don't want anyone to see, so I, 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 um, I, keep, it, I keep the video off. So no one can see that I'm smoking. Uh -huh. But well, uh, well, this, is, this uh, is one of the few places I can do it. Uh -huh. so. Gotcha. Well, a glimpse into the life of Brent. Thanks so much. For I know, right? <laughs> um, oh, I know. I think this is the one. Well, you can tell us about it because I think I saw this poem just through this uh, painting just recently, right? So tell us about it. Yeah. Well, it's another Vermeer, mm -hmm. um, and it's um, a girl reading a letter uh, by a window. And it's uh, long been a, 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 a topic of discussion. What in the world could the, she be? Could the letter be about? And and it's you can't really tell much by the expression on her face and everything. But <clears throat> about a year ago, in August of last year, um, they unveiled a restored. Um, they unveiled the painting restored to its original state mm -hmm. which has um a painting of cupid behind her about 70 years after vermeer's death somebody painted over that painting in the background and made it just blank wall uh -huh. yeah and so um uh everyone is is certain now that it's got something to do with uh, uh that sort of stuff going on yeah so i wrote it from i wrote it from her point of view yeah, very interesting. Yeah, this was an article. Um, I, I think some people wrote poets respond stories or, or poems yeah, it, at the time. Yeah, um, I don't think we published I, it, any, but it was really interesting to to look at that, the, to compare the two, and how that painting was hidden for however many hundred years. It was really neat. Yeah, yeah, it's a cool story. Um, okay, so girl reading a letter at an open window with Cupid. I've been reading this letter for centuries. The words never made much sense to me. My back is straight, my hands don't tremble. The parchment, though, has begun to crumble. The words seemed to swim in an inky sea. I've been reading this letter for centuries. The sunlight, so full of glory, strikes the paper like a fist. The dark fishes jump and skim. Sometimes I feel more at home reflected in the window panes unrecognizable, diffused, and with a soft glow. I always imagined I could tell who it was from, the shadow of his brow, the haystack scent of him. I've been reading this letter for centuries. Only lately did I begin intensive art therapy. With scalpel and microscope, a breathless team dug through the dirt on the wall behind me. As the God of love slowly began to emerge from his lonely obscurity, my heart surged with new hope. Albrecht, 
I know you again. Your scraped knuckles and joyful grin. Your words are clear now. This is how it ends. To find you is just to lose you. No amends. Still, my back is straight. My hands don't tremble. I'll have to read this letter for centuries. Oh, I love that ending. That's great. The girl girl reading a letter in an open window with Cupid now. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Brad. Good stuff as always. Great. Thanks, Tim. Yep. Appreciate yep. it. Have Take a good care. one. Yep. You too. All right. We've got one more person here, and it is um, Vrongen. Hi, Tim. Hello. Uh, uh, so this must be um, um, Jayanti Rangan, right? That's right. That's Excellent. right. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Uh, where are you calling from? Uh, from Boston. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us. I have another first time uh, guest. It's really cool to, to hear you. Yeah. And, uh, this poem is called uh, Memory Precipice. Mm -hmm. If dementia fails my recall, will I be still alive in swaddled chaos? Tamp tucked like a lone cicada in a crypt hole, flightless. To distract my worry, I pick up a novel. The cover looks foggy, like a fading intimacy. I flip and read the gist. Yes, I remember this book, Migrations, and wonder if my mental relocation will end my full screen and put me in a house where I'll see the road, but the sign will read, these pathways are closed. Find alternate routes. Excellent. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. Um, and Thank that you. Was a, yeah, that was a memory precipice. Um, thanks so much for sharing that. Great to have you on. Is that the, this is the only one you sent, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I hope you can call in again um, and share. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you. Yep. Take care. You too. Bye. All right. Yeah. And that was um, um, Jayathani, um, Jayathani, Jayanthi, sorry, Rangan uh, with Memory Precipice. Thanks so much. Um, great to have first time callers. I think we had three today. Um, really good stuff. So um, I'm going to close up the Zoom. That is going to be it for uh, the Zoom. You can watch the tiny bit end of the show over on YouTube. But uh, bye, everybody on Zoom. And um, now we are going to, let's see if we have any poems that I should read. Um, oh, Nivedita is here. Okay, so let's download Nivedita's poem. And uh, while that is downloading, I will, uh, let's look at, let's look at, uh, this poem here, this is by Carlton Johnson. And um, does he have a note? Um, he said it's from a poet for this poet response segment, he says. Uh, it's to walk on the moon. Uh, so here's Carlton Johnson's poem. To walk on the moon for Nicole um, Ainapu uh, Man. Here we go. To walk on the moon. Uh, to Walk on the Moon by Carlton Johnson. You are soon space-bound, about to embark on a return to Sister Moon. That dark gray ashy ball brought to us by the raven to shine a light during the night and to remind everyone of time, solid, dense, old man face, ever-present. We and our ancestors came up with stories of how the moon came to be, grew out of dust, now another Greek god, Artemis, twin of Apollo, will hurl you towards our lovely, lonely Luna as we make another offering to our months. You may become the first Indian woman to leave a footprint on the moon. When you go, remember not to forget the dream weaver your grandma made for you. The dreams of hope keep you and your Wallachy people moving forward in spite of the hardships like walking on sharp rocks or breathing dust caught and the intake. Take a clear breath with vision. It is your journey and ours. You may soon marvel at home from 250,000 miles away, the only 
place for water as you exhale. The particles of water are trapped in your space suit, and the tears of awe and wonder taste like salt. This is Carlton Johnson's poem. Uh, thanks so much for sharing that, Carlton. To walk on the moon. Excellent. Good work as always. And uh, let me go back to Nivedita's now. Okay, so here comes uh, The Smile by Nivedita Karthik. Um, let's see. Here is uh, The Smile. My name is Nivedita, and this is my attempt at the prompt poem for Atle Cast. Um, so the portrait painting that I've chosen is probably the most famous one of all time. And once I read through the poem, I think it's pretty easy to figure out which portrait I'm talking about. So this is the poem. The smile. You think you know me, all of you. You think I smile, all of you. You think I smile at you, for you. How naive of you. Do you know how odd it is to be here, forever in the spotlight, the sinusure of so many eyes, so many eyes that see nothing beyond my smile. I'm lonely here, alone in my golden frame, stuck in a two-dimensional cage against this white wall with none for company. I'm lonely and alone. My mood has been captured in the dark colors, my sorrow in the shadowy landscape, my pain in the brush strokes, but you don't see that. All you see is my smile. My smile that is as artificial as the millions of you showing interest in me. Artificial, for you know nothing of me, nothing of the painting, nothing of the reason behind the painting, nothing at all. To all of you, I'm just a check mark, one of the many you wish to cross off during your life, and so. I smile, my artificial smile, for the million artificial yous, so that I can hope to find one person, one true person, the one true person that sees me for me, sees me trapped in my smile, sees the lack of a light in my eyes, and in their mind, that person is the one to set me free, to let me feel, let me cry, let me be me, let me stop smiling. Thank you. Yeah, thanks as always. That was a Nivedita Karthik with the smile. Always a pleasure to see your smile, Nivedita. Um, let us go to... Um, let's see. Okay. Let's go to um, Che Guevara's poem. This is uh, going to be... Um, based on this uh, painting right here, Ted says, um, I was rummaging for a classical portrait, maybe by uh, Rembrandt or, I, why, I'm just, this is one of those days where I have to try to pronounce things I have no idea how to pronounce, Modigliani, Modigliani. Um, but I came across this girl with symmetric hair. At first glance, you'd think anime, but the longer I stared, the stronger the subject of gymnastic strict discipline came at me, something I have not written about, and to catch it from a 12-year-old's point of view, well, it became a poetic challenge. So this is this um, painting right here. It looks kind of digital-ish. Um, and um, here is uh, Ted Guevara's poem to go with it. Jitters. Tournament Eve, I woke looking for my mind while the earth outside is killing itself with folded grace. I went out with my unprepared self there came a rumble under my feet, boost, boastful and gasping at the same time. So you've come to dilly-dally, it reverberated. I shook where I stood, thought for a moment, and gave this lame excuse. I've forgotten my dog. Go on, sir. Quake. Crack. Split. That gym in half. So I can walk poggy in the morning. Tomorrow I will see my feet. My stomach I won't, for it would be empty. My mother will be watching from the up. I will be older than her for four minutes. My father says, my father stays home and mingled with the earth. So you're calm as me, my father would say. It's not surprise season, the earth says. I can't, well, splinter roots now. That would be lame. 
The pug has growth in her eye, but she would wag her tail, happy when I'm back to my young age, to my old self. Very interesting poem. Thanks so much for sharing that. It was Jitters uh, by Ted Bernal Guevara. Thanks, Ted. Always a pleasure to uh, be able to read your poems. And I think that is going to be it because I'm looking back through and the other ones are not for uh, the open lines. Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's finish out the show for the day with our Saiku. Um, and the Saiku is this. It's based on this article right here. Uh, this is from right down the street from me. Um, from UCLA uh, newsroom. And here is the article I was looking at. Uh, This is a simple method destroys dangerous forever chemicals, making water safe. Um, And you've probably seen the stories where how even rainwater has these PFAS chemicals, these compounds that are there. Nature can't break the binds between carbon and fluorine. And um, so these things last forever almost. And they're forever chemicals. There's 12,000 of them that we've chronicled, and they're polluting even rainwater. Uh, But using common reagents and heated water, chemists can behead and break down PFAs, leaving only harmless compounds. And that is the really good news article here. I mean, good news as far as uh, it can be centered around bad news, that these exist in the first place. But um, interesting technique to uh, clean our drinking water and make it safer. So that was always nice to see. And this is the uh, haiku, or the saiku, uh, right here. A one-liner. A one-line haiku. Nothing lasts forever drinking water. Nothing lasts forever drinking water. That is your one-line haiku. And that is the uh, show for this week. Thanks so much for joining us. It was definitely a pleasure. Um, Rachel's book is just amazing. I mean, I really... I don't know. It got to me just thinking about, you know, the things that can happen to your kids and and then that all the things doctors go through. It's a very uh, just powerful book. It was great to have her on and and very inspiring in a number of ways. Um, So wonderful episode today. Now your prompt for next week, um, given by Rachel, is right here. Uh, Craft a poem that connects to a folktale, Bible story, fairy tale, mythology, etc., and gives us a new perspective, turning it on its head. So, so take a take a fairy tale, a folk tale, something like that, and turn it on its head in a poem. That is our Rachel's prompt for you. Her challenge. Hope you can do it, and hope uh, you can share it next week. Uh, next week's guest on the Rattlecast is going to be um, is going to be uh, January Gill Ar- O'Neill. Um, she has a new book, Rewilding, uh, which is wonderful. She has a poem in the new issue. You see the new issue cover on the background of that uh, slide right there. Um, January has been in, I think, three issues of Rattle now. Um, She's going to be the guest next week, 159, a wonderful book, Rewilding, uh, with a beautiful cover. That is uh, Rattlecast number 159. Next uh, Monday, September 12th, the regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great time. In the meantime, and I will talk to you later. Good night.